I vote because my voice matters. I vote because my voice matters. I vote. I vote. I vote. I vote because America matters. Because my opinion matters. Because freedom matters. I vote because I matter. I vote because my future matters. I vote because my generation matters. I vote. I vote because who we elect to Congress matters. I vote because the midterm matters. I vote because the midterm matters. I vote because the midterm matters. Welcome everyone to the 8th Annual National Agenda Speaker Series, brought to you by the University of Delaware's Center for Political Communication, with support from the Office of the Provost. Our program tonight is also co-sponsored by the Cybersecurity Initiative here at UD. I'm Dr. Lindsay Hoffman, I'm the Director of National Agenda, and I'm also the Associate Director of the Center for Political Communication. This year's theme, Midterm Matters. We'll be talking all things related to midterm elections, as well as issues that matter for the midterm elections. The CPC is a nonpartisan organization, and we've featured speakers across the spectrum. You may recall last fall, we had a conversation with Joe Biden and John Kasich. Uh, our first speaker, just a couple of weeks ago, was Lauren Duca, an opinion columnist for Teen Vogue. She demonstrated that opinions matter, and opinions can sometimes divide and offend. Uh, but our goal here is to model civil dialogue, speaking with Americans from across the political spectrum, from a variety of age groups, young and old, from different backgrounds and different parts of this very diverse country. And in election years, yes, even in the midterms, it's more important than ever to talk to a variety of folks to get perspectives on issues that matter the most. Coming up, we'll hear from a 16-year-old who writes a daily political newsletter with more than 50,000 subscribers, a writer from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and two Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists from The Washington Post. And of course, the Delaware debates will happen right here on October 17th. This is also the second year of our audio essay contest with the theme, Voices Matter. Check out cpc.udel.edu to find out more about that contest. And if you appreciate these events, please sign up for the Center for Political Communication email list outside in the lobby, and we can continue to bring you high-quality programming. Uh, and you can also contribute via cbc.udel.edu slash support. Yes, I'm gonna be reading a lot of URLs this evening. We'll have an audience Q&A towards the end of this talk, but you can also tweet using the hashtag UDELAgenda for a chance to join the discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to remind the audience that civil and courteous dialogue is vital to the success of our program. And although it may seem that the dialogue we see is so contentious and so vicious, we can come together and engage in civil dialogue. And I hope that's what we can demonstrate here. So come open-minded and compassionate, and you may come away with some real uh, clues for uh, open-ended constructive communication. Either way, let's all agree to be candid and courteous of others' views. So, without further ado, tonight, David DeWalt is the former CEO of computer security company McAfee and cybersecurity company FireEye. He's currently chairman of the board for cybersecurity firm Clarity and managing director of Allegis Cyber, a cybersecurity venture capital firm. He was appointed in 2011 by President Barack Obama to the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Council. He has spoken numerous times at the World Economic Forum in Davos, as well as panel discussions uh, addressing world leaders. In 2015, he delivered the commencement address at UD, where he graduated from, with a, a degree in computer science and engineering in 1986, so he's a blue hen. At the ceremony, he was also awarded an honorary doctor of science degree. What makes DeWalt unique is his embrace, embrace of both success and loss. He acknowledges that both of these things can make you stronger, and he was a very inspiring speaker to my students earlier today. But what I hope DeWalt will talk to us about tonight, at least in part, is his career that has seen cybersecurity threats evolve from computer viruses and worms in the 1990s to advanced persistent threats to what he refers to as attacks on subdomains of cyberspace. So let's get this conversation started. Please join me in giving a big welcome to Blue Hen, David DeWalt. Hi there. 
So we forgot to say fighting blue hen, right? It's, it's just make sure I get that mascot right. Fighting with the... Fighting yeah. blue hen. <laughs> I always remind my parents that it's fighting blue hens, not blue hens, right? And I noticed your logo is getting a little more menacing now, the blue hen, right? Is it? Yeah, marketing department's working on that well. I enjoy that. Well, thank you so much for being here. If you could start us off just by talking about what is the current state of cybersecurity? How has it uh, evolved since you got in, into the industry and what can we expect from the future? Just a brief commentary. Have we handed out cocktails yet? Are we, like, <laughs> I'm gonna give a pretty ominous view on things a little bit. It's so gonna I'm, get gonna, a little dark. I'm gonna prepare it. I'm a very positive person after all the years of being a CEO and, and a lot of optimism around companies and building companies. But I talk about the state of cybersecurity with a, a bit of a, um, an analogy. I call it the perfect storm. And I've talked about this for years, but there's a set of conditions that are occurring in cyberspace that are essentially creating what, what I think of as a perfect storm, where all vectors of confluence are coming together to create almost a perfect environment to really affect our lives in almost every way, shape, and form. So I talk about it this way. You know, first of all, mankind over, over the centuries and thousands of years, whenever they discovered a new domain, we ended up having conflicts over those domains, right? So as mankind discovers lands, we would have armies, you know, fight battles over it, whether it's the oceans, we'd have navies fight um, battles over it, uh, the air supremacies during the wars, obviously, space and now cyberspace. And here we are basically having cyber wars and massive conflicts in this domain called cyberspace. But the conditions are so different than all the other domains like land and air and oceans and space because you can't see your enemy. You have this problem called anonymity on the internet. And because of the speed of innovation right now and capitalism, we're watching such an explosion of vulnerabilities across all of our technology infrastructure. And that's just a fact. Almost every corporation is dealing with hundreds and hundreds of patches almost on a weekly basis trying to figure out how to patch vulnerabilities. And all these vulnerabilities have opened up the Western world and most of the world at this point to a lot of different types of attackers. So all these vulnerabilities have given rise to lots of attacker groups as well as attacker types. And we've watched what once was just a handful of nations, mostly the offensive agencies of those nations, give rise to now, we track well in excess of 800 adversarial groups with cyber capability. And of course, those 800 groups we track individually, they all have somewhat of a forensics kind of underpinning to them, and we can track who's doing what to whom for the most part. And this is the forensics of a lot of the companies that I'm focused on. But we went from what I think of as kind of hacktivism and sensationalism as a danger as a result of all these attacker groups to now what I think of is you know, high-end crime, not just in our commerce systems and our financial payment systems, but now our cryptocurrency environments, now to massive espionage type activities brought on by what I call the great IP war with China. Uh, we then now are facing information warfare with Russia and now escalating into both terrorism and warfare at a pretty unprecedented level. And IP, just for those of us who don't know. Oh, intellectual property, sorry. I may, uh, you have to find me for every acronym I use that you don't know <laughs> or raise your hand if it's all right. I tend to use them a lot. But think about all these dangers, think about all these vulnerabilities, and then it's all compounded by a couple of things. Number one is the lack of governance across the internet. We've had a lot of balkanization to our internet uh, substructures, which has created nationalism across those internet properties, which is now creating mechanisms of different governance models. Look at the United States internet model versus China's internet model, for example, versus uh, other countries. We have really a, uh, a complete change with the law enforcement models in cyber, which is almost completely ineffective for a lot of reasons. Uh, not a lot of law uh, around this. We've um, arrested a few individuals over the years, but compared to the amount of uh, attacks and offensive um, results, compared to the amount of arrests, let's just say we're in the point before you get to a decimal and before you get to a digit. And what you're finding is the success in these arenas is high. It's 99% oftentimes that these crimes and attacks can, can be... Uh, can be able to be perpetrated. And then, of course, that anonymity, 
and ultimately we've had a very poor defense to keep up with all the attacker groups. And one of the reasons for that is the offense in many cases is governments. So today there's 3,152, I believe, cybersecurity companies. Uh, the market is about 120 billion in cyber spend. Uh, that's up over 100 billion in 10 years to give you an idea of how big this market has grown, but yet most of the commercial defense is still highly ineffective to offensive governments because billions of dollars of research going into the offensive units of large superpowers compared to research and development of the largest cybersecurity company, which may be in a couple thousand engineers, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge and it's hard to keep up. So you have almost this perfect storm of conditions that has created the state of cyber to be super challenging and very unique in anything we've ever seen before. Couple that with, we live in what we call an asymmetric theater. And what's an asymmetric theater? A, co a country the size of the United States, while having some of the greatest offensive capabilities, probably has the greatest weakness of defense too, because all this technology has created all these vulnerabilities which create an inability to use that offense effectively because we're so prone and so vulnerable ourselves. And that's why we've seen North Korea's attacks be so successful, Iranian attacks be so successful, criminal groups, Russian influence campaigns, and others, because we have such an underpinning of vulnerability ourselves. And the smallest country in the world can do harm to the largest country in the world, where in the physical kinetic world, that probably wouldn't be the case. In the cyberspace world, that is the case. Only a handful of researchers could put a tremendous amount of pain into a large country the size of the United States. So a very interesting world we're growing up in. And in the intro, Lindsay talked a little bit about some of these subdomains and things that are going on. Some of the things that scare you is watching the social network subdomain or satellite communications or industrial networks or new types of areas of cyberspace that have almost no commercial defense or hygiene for security compared to what the attackers can actually do. So we're always playing a little cat and mouse and trying to catch up, but um, in a way it's a pretty, a pretty dismal environment right now and why I spend a lot of time trying to educate on this area because, and I hate to say sometimes you know, you're right, but you could see some of the challenges coming to America long before they actually occurred and just because of our situation we're in, and here we are facing some of those crises sometimes now, and uh, haven't done anything about it. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's interesting to think about this as kind of a cat and mouse game. I've thought about that before. How, are, do you feel like the cybersecurity industry is sort of just always kind of retroactively acting to things, or do you think that we're getting to a place where they're actually responding and planning in advance? It's starting to get there. Um, I think through, there's some really promising technologies that have come out. Artificial intelligence has been an incredible area of data science where we can do modeling, we can look at lots of scenarios and simulations to see how the attackers may come in, and it gives us a lot more visibility to the problem than we had before. I'll give you an example just to tell you how hard this problem was. When I was CEO of McAfee, um, we ended up having a, uh, what's called the DAT engine, which is essentially the virus engine that updates your computing device, um, you know, sometimes on an hourly basis or an everyday basis. We had 68 million unique signatures in that engine. This is back in 2011, just to give you an idea. So 68 million viruses with a unique footprint or fingerprint to is what we had to stop on a daily basis and track. Can you imagine that in the physical virus world? Not so easy. And this number is only continuing to escalate. So it's very hard in a reactive world where you see a new virus, you have to write a signature to block that virus and try to keep up with the attackers. And you're always a little bit behind. Now, just in the last 18 months or so, there's been a raise of hope about maybe how we can do anomalous behavioral detection using artificial intelligence tools to maybe predict a little bit more where the attackers could come in, and the gap is closing a little bit in some areas, but still we're challenged in, in many places at this point. So, should we have cocktails now? <laughs> <laughs>
let's talk about McAfee. I think on, on April uh, 21st in 2010, walk us through what happened that day. Those were day. my handshakes now <laughs> when you make me remind me of I that. I think this is a great example of not only kind of how we are in such a tenuous situation with, uh, with cybersecurity, but also for our communication students, kind of a good example of how to deal with crisis and how to, how to manage the public relations associated with the crisis. So walk us through it. Yeah. So April 21st, 2010 is a date I'll never forget as long as I live. Um, it was probably my, my biggest failure and then ultimately my biggest success wrapped in a single day. So not easy to, not easy to do. But I woke up that morning, um, 6 a.m. I get a call or about 6.15 in the morning I get a call from all our research. You better hurry into the office. We've had a bit of a crisis. Um, what the crisis was, was we sent out a faulty release of our antivirus software, essentially creating a computing environment for every computer that received our update that would prevent it from booting. And we blue screened, anybody hear that team? Blue screening a Microsoft device. We prevented it from rebooting and you couldn't turn the computer on. You, you could turn it off, turn it back on, it's still blue screened because we quarantined by accident a piece of the operating system that was vital to the boot process. Now, it sounds like an obvious thing you should have caught, but we were racing over the night because we had an alert from one of the agencies that a particularly nasty virus was spreading, and our researchers were working all night trying to come up with a remedy for that. At 6 a.m., we released the virus, and we brought down 3.2 million computers and 1,672 companies in 16 minutes. So that wasn't a good day to show up at the office. Um, <laughs> and literally, I'll always remember these numbers because 1,672 companies got affected. Um, some of them were you know, some of the most vital corporations in the world. Uh, unfortunately, a lot were in Europe um, because they had woken up first and the East Coast of the United States, the West Coast wasn't affected too much because it was still early. But everyone trusted the security company to update the software. And if we made a mistake, you know, um, they weren't expecting it. So we brought down a lot of computers. Thank God after 16 minutes, they realized that the release was faulty, they rolled it back, and nobody else got injured. But let's just say it took somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five days for every company to get back online because they had to literally reload the operating system to every computer, 3.2 million computers. So that got affected. So this wasn't as simple as just a cloud update that you might have today, let's just say. So um, what we ended up doing was within an hour, I created a video that um, maybe I'm most proud of to this day, which was acknowledging it was all my fault and the company's fault, and I took full responsibility for the mistake. Now, when lawyers are in your ear and communication experts are in your ear, don't tell me not to admit it was my fault because of liability, um, I went against that judgment, and you can see the video if you Google it. Uh, it's on there, Dave DeWalt 5958, which was the number of the release. But I freely admitted it was my fault, and a funny thing happened, empathy. And empathy occurred because the clients realized, well, it wasn't a malicious attacker. They admitted it was their fault. And why wasn't the other companies trying to fix the virus too? And it sort of started to spiral in a way, in a positive way. I had already lost 40% of my market cap. All the television stations were in my lobby, and I'm on the 11th floor thinking, how do I get out of here fast? And uh, it wasn't good. But one of the companies that got injured that day was Intel Corporation. And um, Intel's an amazing company. They wanted to figure out a way to never let this happen again. And we designed a feature into their i-series chips using the trusted service memory layer to enable us to reboot automatically in the event of a catastrophic failure to the operating system. And a few months later, less than 90 days later, they bought the company for almost $8 billion in cash, which was a positive uh, outcome, which uh, not only did we recover the uh, stock value, we went up another 60% in value. Not one company sued us. In fact, we did more business with those 1,672 companies in the next three-month period than they'd done in the lifetime with McAfee. So wow, is that a communication story, at least how I learned. And I always tell the story like about honesty and humility. 
And uh, whatever was natural or the way I grew up, it was just one of those moments where I felt like honesty and humility was just super required because of what had occurred. And I had to admit the mistake that occurred. And I thank God I did it so quickly and got out in front of the news cycle and the companies rallied behind me and rallied behind the company. And we ended up getting elevated and then Intel bought the company and um, that was a good outcome for our shareholders and our employees and a uh, pretty amazing story. But um, kind of a crazy day. Not one I recommend waking up to regularly. Well, at, at the risk of a this is your life moment, I believe we actually do have that oh, you video, have the video pulled up. Oh, God. <laughs> Would we like to go ahead and play that for oh, everybody? Oh God, you found it online. Hello, my name's Dave DeWalt. I'm the president and CEO of McAfee. Last Wednesday, April 21st, McAfee responded to a new global threat to Windows PCs and released a virus signature file that caused some of our customers' computers to shut down until they could be repaired and rebooted. I take full responsibility for what has occurred, and I want to take this opportunity to offer you my deepest apologies on behalf of McAfee and underscore how extremely sorry we are. Even among the vast majority of customers who did not experience operating disruptions, the mere possibility created an unwelcome distraction and reason for concern. We've been at... Oh, that's... All right, you can cut it from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's good enough. You guys can watch it later. You know, the biggest mistake I made in that video, I don't know if you caught it, which is in hindsight and communications, I made one error. Does anybody know what the error was? It was probably the biggest single error I made in that video and it was already said. I said the vast majority of customers who didn't get affected, you know, we were, we were concerned with, but what happened to the 1% that did? So they all felt even more terrible because they weren't in the vast majority that did. So I shouldn't have overstated the vast majority did not get affected and those who were affected felt even worse by that one statement. Now, in the grand scheme of what we went through and how we helped them later, you know, it was a positive outcome, but I learned in communications, never minimize numbers, minimize numbers when you don't have like, the context for everybody else. So that was a little bit of uh, a learned lesson there because everybody's like, wait, I'm in the 1%, why am I in the 1%? And the CEOs were asking their chief security officers, why was the vast majority not affected, but we were. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of snowballed a little bit in a learned lesson of communications in a crisis is, you know, numbers matter, timing matters. And in that case, I shouldn't have probably said vast majority didn't get affected. So anyway, yeah, things you so, learn, right? Yeah, <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, we learned opinions matter. People who have opinions, it's important for the attempt to express them. It's also important to understand timing and strategy in communication and how you communicate that effectively. So I think that's a great example. Um, I'm going to switch things a little, up a little bit uh, because um, most of our students are very engaged in social media. We talked about this a lot today. Really? Is that true? Yeah. There's this like Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat. And uh, we just saw today that there were some uh, social media company and large tech companies on the Hill today talking about issues related to privacy. Um, but Mark Zuckerberg uh, sat in front of Cap the Capitol, sat in Capitol Hill um, answering what, this is qu a question from a student, Natalie, in our class, answering what the Daily referred to as what seemed like a really bad tech support call. <laughs> Um, if you had been in a position uh, where Mark Zuckerberg was in, where he was kind of having to answer for some of the trouble that happened in the 2016 election, would you have done it differently? I guess the first thing I'd say is uh, I'm appreciative that he's there. And for whatever it's worth, there was a lot of challenges that went on at Facebook during that election process and, and issues, but owning it later, at least he's doing, and I applaud that, right? So in a lot of ways, trying to fix it now, he doesn't have to go in front of some of those um, some meetings. He, he, in a lot of cases, he's testifying voluntarily to try to improve. So I, I, I just start with that because a lot of companies will hide in a crisis, not, you know, step forward. You know, I always talk about bats and moths in a crisis. You know, bats and moths, some step forward into the light like a moth and some step back in the light. And, you know, which one are you? And in that case, I was happy to see a step forward 
And um, I thought that was to be applied. But, but then don't you get zapped? <laughs> <laughs> don't fly too close to the light. That's the kid. You know, just, have it, just have it right. But, um, you know, listen, there, there's a lot happening, uh, obviously, in the election process, and I think for Facebook. And it comes down in cybersecurity a lot of times to visibility. Do you have visibility to what's happening in your platform? Unfortunately, Facebook did not have a lot of visibility to what was happening in the platform. Nobody really did. And unfortunately, who was to see the you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of ads, tens of thousands of false identities that were being set up, the social influence campaigns, the automated software that was distributing that content, that was not easy to see when you have a billion users on your platform. And it was hard to see they were in precincts and in battleground states and how the influence was occurring and what device of content was created. So hindsight's 2020. But, you know, having said that, um, I mean, it occurred. We had a, a, major, a major effect on our democratic processes. And, uh, you know, curious, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit. It's like, what are we doing to prepare for it? But the fact that they're there, they're working hard on it, is highly encouraging. So. Well, and to follow up on that, um, uh, uh, when he appeared before Congress, uh, several senators actually revealed that they didn't know very much about Facebook. Uh, Orrin Hatch actually asked, so how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Is the disconnect between what's happening in uh, government and what's happening in the tech industry ultimately damaging to how secure we all are? Yeah, you really find that. And uh, I've discovered this even, you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s now, but you realize the technology gap I have even to the students that are here but you really see it to our congressmen and women and senators with their age demographics, and that's no, that's no knock on them, but they didn't grow up necessarily in the, in the knowledge era and computing eras that others did, and you can really see it just like, how do you make money on, a, on Facebook, right? <laughs> or, you know, what, what's there if they don't pay for it? Like, these are really common sense things perhaps to us, but if you didn't grow up in that era, you don't know, and then you also well, don't so know what- let's explain, how do they make their money? Well, just through advertising impressions and obviously, um, you know, a lot of content that is being distributed on a paid basis. Uh, obviously, this is an era that, you know, new consumer models are being created. I mean, right now there's 3.8 billion users on social media platforms. There's 83 social networks, considered social network, 83 of them with over 100 million users active. So if you think about that, now there's overlap across those 83 networks, but I mean, We've never seen anything like this. This all showed up in the last couple of years, and the content virality is off the chart. So we had a crisis, uh, Lindsay didn't mention, I, I chair safety and security for Delta Airlines, uh, proud to be on the board, and uh, when there's a crisis with the airline, uh, whether it's something that seems small, like a passenger, you know, perceived to being booted off the flight for some disruptive, we could get 100 million views in an hour. And we're living in an era of speed of information and perception that the information I'm seeing is true. Therefore, you're guilty before you could even reply. And so this type of network and this type of information is something brand new to this world in a way that we don't know how to interact with. And frankly, even the founders of these companies are still wrestling with how big their platforms have become, how important their platforms are, how influential those platforms are, and what do we do about it? I, I talk a little bit about what I call the 55 states of America. Some of the students heard this, but the 55 states of America, not only the 50 states that you know, but the five technology companies that are bigger than any individual state has become and these being Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook and Google, two of which have crossed a trillion dollar market cap this past year, uh, many of which are having cash flows bigger than any single state, bigger profitability, almost immune to regulation, global companies, and if Apple decides not to let your phone get open for privacy reasons, even though there's a terroristic threat to that device, so be it, Tim Cook decides. No knock on Tim, but it's the reality of what we're dealing with. We now have five corporations that are so powerful and so massive, and we're so reliant on their technology for what we see, what search results we see, what influence we might get on that social platform. Do we trust their integrity, their ideology? Um, it's a real question. And who governs them for what search results you see? They're testifying about that now. 
but ultimately what algorithms go into that, it's a fascinating situation that we're in. And there's almost no end in sight because the distance of the 50 states and the GDP versus these corporations are only getting wider and wider. And they're not beholden to an individual country necessarily, they do operations all over the world. So we have a fascinating challenge coming with these technology companies' power. And ultimately their responsibility of that power is really gonna fall on probably their consciousness <laughs> as opposed to law hmm. or to national, uh, national interests because they are so global. And you're finding that a, a very new situation in my opinion that we've never seen before. And uh, it's a little tongue in cheek saying 55 states because there's a few other corporations rising uh, amazingly too. And the five largest companies, you know, five of the largest companies now don't even make a single product. You think about Air Airbnb and Uber, you know, these companies, eBay's of the world, they don't even make a product, you know, they're just brokers for other people's technology. And ultimately you have a, a really fascinating situation coming in the next few years with power struggle between government and corporation. Well, it's interesting you bring up this kind of consciousness that, that has to guide what, what these, uh, big five or the, you know, the, the extra five states are doing. Um, a lot of my students have been really interested in following the controversy around Alex Jones uh, of InfoWars. Um, and Catherine, uh, a student in National Agenda, asked, uh, in August, many social media platforms, including Apple, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and Spotify, banned Alex Jones for violating their policies, but Twitter didn't initially ban him, stating that he didn't break any of their policies. Do you think social media platforms have a responsibility to remove high-profile users who use a platform to spread conspiracy theories and or hate speech? So you got to think about this from a number of angles. So you can ask me, Dave Dwalt, my opinion as a consumer and citizen of the United States, and I would say I do, they do have a responsibility to govern what's right and what's wrong. I think that's just humankind to, to do what's right and wrong. That's my view. If I'm an investor now, and I'm a shareholder in these corporations, or I'm a board of director, I have fiduciary responsibility, duty of care as it's called, to essentially manage the shareholder value of that corporation, which may be in conflict to the ideology of doing right and wrong necessarily about that. So that gets very interesting as well. There is no components of our duty of care necessarily in our board governance models and shareholder governance models that is talking about these types of topics now. And so it's all new ground again that I think we're getting into in the world of cyberspace and influence in that space that we haven't covered. Uh, very little uh, code of conduct type policies are even in place in large corporations. It, it's creeping in a little bit more and every country has slightly different views on that. So again, it's um, you know, very new territory for the world to see how do we interact with sort of the question of right and wrong, and is it right or wrong from which nation's viewpoint is, is very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we can't really talk about cybersecurity issues without talking about 2016. Uh, the presidential election and Russian meddling is the word we keep hearing. Um, so we, it's widely acknowledged that Russia did have something to do with uh, 2016. Um, but how strong is the evidence of election meddling? Uh, this is a question from my student, Noah. And um, uh, something we talked about earlier, earlier today is the Mueller investigation. Do you think that there's evidence of collusion? Oh, yes, yeah, a lot there, huh? Um, I'll answer it this way. I'll, I'll just tell you, so almost 20 years in cybersecurity, uh, I had two large epiphanies in my career, like just major epiphanies, like, wow, pinch me, is this happening kind of moment. And one of them was at the end of 2008, I tell the story of uh, now the company name that I have, Night Dragon Security, but ultimately I was privy to a major uh, campaign, the Chinese Ministry of State Security, uh, essentially imposed on high-tech corporations in uh, Silicon Valley, made famous by Google, who ultimately uh, pulled out of China as a result of seeing evidence of Chinese infiltration and exfiltration of source code and bug research out of Google, pulled out of China, blamed China. We saw that 153 times that day, and, or that, that period, and um, we realized China and its military was attacking commercial companies on American soil. That was a bit of like, wow, 
moment because government on government espionage, okay, we could live with some of that activity. I was seeing a lot of that. But the first time a giant superpower was inflicting a campaign on leveling the playing field of innovation between the United States and China. And as a result, uh, during my days as CEO of FireEye and Mandiant, uh, we ended up responding to 5,772 I repeat that, 5,772 confirmed Chinese espionage breaches on American companies. That is a stunning revelation and epiphany to me. And over a seven, eight-year period, we did very little about that. Uh, China was able to uh, level the playing field quite a bit. I called it the great IP war, intellectual property war, as I said. But the second epiphany happened exactly what you said, Lindsay, was really that um, election window uh, was a period of time where I realized Russia had declared a similar warfare tactic on America in a very brazen way that China did. And if you go back and look at some of the reports that we published for China, we called them the comment crew. They weren't hiding. China didn't even hide. They put comments in Mandarin, some of which, sorry if I swear here, would say, F you, America, in the comments. And, you know, would literally call out America as part of their campaigns to level the playing field. So we knew it was China. We tracked them to their keyboards in Beijing. We called them 61398. It was the unit that was, like, we had them. Like, we, we knew it. And the same certainty of epiphany I have with Russia, with what I saw. And uh, ultimately, uh, we made quite a few arrests. So what's the evidence? We arrested 18 people as part of the Internet Rating Agency, a Russian shell that was set up. They set up automated software. They would set up false identities, tens of thousands of false identities. They would use those false identities, which would look like Americans just like you. They would put them in precincts and, and battleground states. They would create friends and followers around that social media, and they'd send divisive content every day, automated from the letter A to Z in name, putting out that content, changing the sediment of Americans' cultural kind of challenges. And it would be a Black Lives Matter here, or it would be an anti-Hillary message here, a religious message here, a racism message there. And we were watching that content come out. Now, this was a little bit in hindsight, because once we did the report, we ended up seeing all that, but we couldn't see it at the time, neither did Facebook. But the epiphany that the Russian GRU had implemented this was 100% in my opinion. It's not just my opinion, it's everybody's opinion. Uh, it's in the world of cyber. Uh, we ended up arresting uh, people and shut down agencies as a result, uh, or companies that were operating in this way. And, um, you know, how big was the sentiment change? I don't know that. Did it look like it was in the millions and millions and millions of people? Sure did to me. Because you could track it by sentiment. You know, what were they liking? What were they following? What did they open? And more and more, they were opening an anti-democratic, anti-Clinton message. So that brought out a lot of voters from what I could see that either didn't vote for Hillary or voted for Trump, and it looked like that was a massive change in the model that occurred. Uh, we do know this. There was no effect, we believe, to the actual people voting. 59 million people voted for Trump. 62 million people voted for Hillary, I think, were the numbers. And those were actual counts. But the change during that period... One other piece of data, we were hired in several cases to monitor the night of election servers and things, and ultimately we stopped seeing intrusions into those servers or probes into those servers, and we wondered why. It was like crickets. It was suddenly like, why, isn't, why aren't we seeing this? Because we thought that we would see that just from all the reconnaissance we had, and it stops, and we didn't see anything through election night, which we went, wow, that's great, nothing happened. But then in hindsight, we saw the social influence was working. That's why they stopped going through the front door. They went through the side door of social influence that ultimately was the way in which they undermined our processes. So they were relying on other people to share, continue sharing that information? False identities, mm -hmm. right. So they would set up, uh, I think one of them was Susan Atkins, I forgot her name, um, but they would start with the letter A, They'd set up an identity, look like an American, put that American into a Ohio, in an area of Ohio, create friends and followers all around that person, and start, Susan would start sending information out to all her neighbors. And then the neighbors would start to share that information, all of which had content integrity issues, but wasn't even true. And so you would start to see, um, you know, the influence campaign working. 
And if you're a Russian intelligence agency and you're actually seeing people read it, open it, share it, say like to it, well, let's do more of that. And the machine was cranking by the election process and night of election, particularly during the Comey period right before the election, we saw a massive amount of that going on. So you can decide, you know, Americans still voted, Americans got influence, yes or no, but certainly the facts of what occurred um, seem obvious to me. Were those cocktails? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scary, right? Um, well, so we're, the midterms are approaching, and I think a lot of our students and community members have questions about, is the intelligence community prepared for uh, wh whether Russia is still trying to interfere in U.S. politics? What has changed about how they're dealing with the threat since 2016? What should they be doing in the midterms of 2018? And this is where we have one of our biggest challenges. I, I talk about the privacy pendulum with the security pendulum. As the privacy pendulum swings to the privacy side, the security becomes weaker. And when the security becomes stronger and the pendulum slides there, privacy becomes more of a challenge. And so right now the pendulum of privacy swung a little hard with what's called GDPR and some of the regulatory components coming out of Europe that American companies have to follow. And of course, post Snowden, some of the FISA warrants that were limited and the ability for agencies to interact with corporations in a way to have them help with that social influence problem has waned to less security and more privacy. So, you know, we're aware of the problem. The question is how much influence is still occurring uh, you're certainly seeing Facebook and others do a lot more effort to shut down false identities. We're reading about that constantly. We're seeing that constantly. There's more software now that helps look for anomalous behavior than we've ever had before, certainly in 2016. So, you know, we've upped our game, but technology's up too. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see as we um, uh, figure out what the effects were. One thing I think that's interesting is um, there's some, been some polling recently on uh, how Americans feel about the upcoming midterms and how concerned they are about whether their vote will count and whether they are, um, uh, whether the midterm elections will be valid. And so this is a poll from uh, NPR and Marist who said that, actually demonstrated there's a large partisan gap, which interests me, in perceptions that the U.S. is prepared to keep the fall midterm elections safe and secure. So a majority of Democrats say the U.S. is not prepared and under 20% of Republicans say so. So first of all, do you, uh, kind of expanding on that, do you think the U.S. is prepared? And second, why is there such a large partisan gap between Democrats and, and Republicans, if you can speak to it, in terms of how we're prepared or not? Is it simply because we're in a Republican presidency? Or is there a misunderstanding between these two people who identify with each party in terms of what the cybersecurity threat is? Uh, the way I look at this, I, I wouldn't talk about it from a political point of view, a readiness point of view, I will. I mean, I, I'm 100% certain, or a 99 and a lot of nines percent certain, we're prepared for a high integrity voting process. Uh, that seems certain to me. We've done a lot of work. The secretaries of state at each of the states, the way we've air-gapped those systems, managed those systems, double-checked those systems, I feel really good that who votes is the right people voting with the right authentication, and we will get a true count of who voted. So I feel good about the integrity of the election process. I don't necessarily feel good about the influence leading up to that process, which is still remains to be seen, kind of what's all been occurring there and how much the technology companies are co collaborating and working together to solve that. And did Russia or other nations come up with alternative models to be able to influence our you know, our systems and our election process. And we can kind of see bits and pieces of that um, pretty regularly. If you pay attention, we've been making more arrests, we've been shutting down more sites, but the antagonizing is still occurring. But, you know, we thought we were there with 2016 and we weren't, so we'll see. Influence versus integrity is a different thing to me. But, you know, it all depends what party you're from, whether you think we're ready or not. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of contentious conversation post-election on the integrity and the influence again. Mm -hmm. It seems like this is gonna be a hot topic. The loser's gonna cry integrity and influence and the winner's gonna say, no, that just seems like it's an obvious thing that's gonna come down. So it's kind of interesting. It seems like cybersecurity is something that is, is 
has evidence and facts behind what's working and what's not has become a partisan issue in terms of what, what people think to, believe to be true or not. I guess so. I mean, as a, as a cyber person, I mean, I don't feel that way. I feel like the forensics and the crime scene, so to speak, in a cyber world leads us to evidence of who the adversaries and how we can attribute. We, we don't always get it right perfectly, but you know, uh, without a shadow of doubt kind of feeling is what we end up getting. That's why I was confident about China and Russia in my conversations, just like I was with some of the Iranian activities or North Korean activities. We kind of know uh, there's what they call TDPs or these types of techniques that are being used in cyber that create a fingerprint of who did it. And you can get a pretty good uh, confidence level of who the attackers are. So that part we know, but you know, all depends on your point of view there. I think it, it just demonstrates the many partisan divides yeah. that we're seeing in the country uh, this, this uh, sure. election year. Um, so I'll, I'll, we're going to do an uh, open audience Q&A in about 13 minutes, but I have a few more questions from my students. Um, this is also regarding a gap, but this is a gender gap. Uh, Sarah asks, there seems to be a significant gender gap among professionals in the cybersecurity field, with women only making up 11% of the field, according to a 2017 study. Do you believe that closing that gender gap would benefit the industry? And do you think the industry needs to make some sort of cultural shift to bring more diversity into it? Women, I hope you go out for cybersecurity. We are thirsty for you know, uh, females uh, in this trade area. Uh, there's a huge shortage of talent, period. Uh, you know, most cyber professionals will tell you that's the number one issue we have in the cyber domain right now is a shortage of talent period, just overall. The amount of workload that corporations have today on the cyber problem versus the amount of resource they have, it's, uh, it's, it's a big gap. And then you get to the gender gap on top of that, and it's, it's, it's massive. So I see that as a tremendous opportunity. Uh, How do you make cybersecurity sexy and fun and interesting to these that. young college yeah. students? <laughs> uh, yeah, if you learn that, can you teach me? Um, <laughs> I think our students learned that today. Hopefully we'll have a couple of them offer some insight in the Q&A. Here's what I love, you know, for whatever it's worth. I, I love the mission of it all. I mean, I fell in love with the industry sector, cybersecurity, because in a lot of ways, yep, capitalism was working really effectively. The market grew, you know, 100 billion over a decade kind of range. And we have this massive opportunity for wealth creation, but you have this great opportunity to, you know, solve a world peace problem, like a, you know, a real world issue. And if we can catch bad guys and we can catch the attackers and we can create integrity in these systems, it feels like such a worthy cause. So that's what really attracted me. And uh, I don't think there's enough professionals out there who um, you know, have gotten educated to that opportunity. It's like solving cancer. You, know, you go into the medical field because maybe you have a vision of one day solving you know, something like that. Here you have a similar opportunity. It's a fascinating uh, field. And it's an unlimited opportunity field. I mean, does anybody think our risks in cyberspace are going down? Like, you know, this market could exponentially grow again over the next decade. It probably will. And, you know, here we have an opportunity, probably of a lifetime to be in it, so lots of encouragement. You know, there's a lot of research to show that uh, the CSI shows um, have increased, you mentioned forensics, it just reminded me of this, have increased students' interest in uh, crime scenes and forensics. We need like a CSI for cybersecurity detectives yeah. <laughs> to get students interested in this, because I don't think they're really thinking about this as much as, as maybe they should. And I think we saw this today when you came to the classroom. And I think, um, b before we move on, I, I think a lot of our college students are wondering, uh, this is a question from Emma, uh, I'm sorry, from Sarah, that says, uh, you know, what do we need to do? How can we combat cybersecurity threats in our own online spheres and physical worlds? You know, these are digital natives. These are the ones who've been connected to the internet since probably they were in the womb. <laughs> and, you know, now that they're becoming aware of some of these threats, what can they do to, at, on a consumer level to prevent them? Okay, so here's my three pieces of advice. Um, I'll just say this outright so you guys can all go home and think about what you could do. Consumers. This is pure consumer. So the three things you should worry about. First of all, you should worry about your identity, right? Obvious area, you know. So there's some really low-cost things you could do to monitor your identity and your, your accounts. 
and there's services that you can buy. Post the Equifax breach, they have their service. I think it's next to free if you're an Equifax uh, user. Uh, there's a famous one called LifeLock that you might have even seen commercials and television on. For under $100 a year, which may or may not sound like a lot of money, you can monitor every account for deviant behavior on your identity. Well worth it, in my opinion, because any transaction that's out of the norm can be blocked and prevented. And if you want to stop crime against yourself, just do that. If you only did that identity protection system, you've just up-leveled a tremendous amount of hygiene for your security posture. That's, that's one. The next thing that you want to do is you typically want good hygiene on authentication. So what does that mean? You don't want anybody to easily steal your credentials so you can get access to your identity. Sounds simple. But there's applications you can download that are relatively free that offer you a second factor or multi-factor authentication. Instead of just putting your username and your dog's name or your kid's name, you basically have other factors to authenticate with. And then it makes it much harder for the attacker to steal your credentials because you basically have multi-factors to log into. Now the phones are starting off for that with facial recognition or fingerprinting, but there's also little pin codes and sequence codes that you could put in that randomize, that add another layer of authentication into your environment. That's what I do. I use a, a little app called Duo, but the idea behind it is just multi-authentication to make it harder. The third area, which is probably one of the biggest attack vectors consumers face, <coughs> is the router, your home router. Everybody know what a router is? So, you know, some people get it from Comcast or Verizon or somebody, but, you know, ultimately that little router is not a very secure router in many cases, and it's also the keys to the kingdom of your house, typically. And now with all the IoT and Internet of Things connecting to your home, you need a secure router. That's really important. Again, relatively inexpensive, but if you can secure the router, perhaps have encrypted, encrypted traffic to your IoT devices, makes it a lot harder for them to steal things from your home. And you know, if you're anything like uh, a lot of people now, everything's becoming digital and everything's connected to the router and ultimately that creates a vulnerability. So a secure router, identity protection, and then ultimately authentication. You do a couple things like that, a couple hundred dollars a year. Let's just say you went from here to there in cyberspace and cyber, you know, consumer security for relatively little money. You yes. notice I didn't mention any virus anywhere in there, right? McAfee, McAfee will be mad at me, but. <laughs> That's great advice. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow-up uh, before we get to the Q&A, and I'll ask um, Parker and Hannah, who are going to be our uh, mic marshals, uh, to go back to the control room and get the... Uh, we have this really cool microphone. It's called a catch box. It's like a box you actually toss around the audience to ask questions. So, yeah, okay. it's, it's cool. It's Is it cool. safe? It's safe. Yeah. It's safe. And we're safe in here. I'm hearing thunder. So we are all good and dry and warm in here. So we're going to have a great Q&A. It's the perfect storm coming. Yeah. <laughs> I planned it that way. Um, but I wanted to follow up because my students also had questions about what, and we have several uh, university uh, representatives here, faculty and, and deans and things, what should universities do to help prepare students to be safe in an in increasingly dangerous cyber world? What do universities need to provide students? Well, I think the first thing to realize, um, you know, in my experience, universities are one of the bigger targets for attackers. So just start with that, because what does a university have that the attackers want? Research, you know, admissions information, financial information. Typically, parents supply a lot of information to the university, wire transfer information, banking account information, lots of credential information, and on top of that, they have a lot of research or grants and it becomes a bit of a target. And then it has one of the easiest vectors of attack, typically, because the students are bringing whatever technology and applications they want to bring in, connecting to the network, and it's a very challenging environment to protect. But what should a university do? Understand that, number one. Number two, um, educate the students to the risks online. And I don't think a lot of universities do that well enough. It's amazing after 20 years of challenges in cyberspace, we only have a handful of universities with a full cybersecurity curriculum in the United States. I mean, talk about where the education gap is and the shortage of uh, personnel, but there's only a few in America that actually have these programs. 
And uh, I'm surprised there's not a cybersecurity major that you would take, uh, that you would get full accredited degrees in or master's degrees in because you, know, you now have a 100 billion plus market and it's a pretty sizable job opportunity. So, you know, just can we build curriculums? Can we create training and education at a better level? Can we prepare for some of the attacks that are occurring on the universities and uh, their endowments and their funds and things? So, you know, very interesting uh, opportunity for, I think, universities like Delaware here to take the lead, especially with the proximity that Delaware has to Washington, to New York, to a lot of high tech here in the region, great, great chance. All right, well, I hope we do create something like that at the University of Delaware. <laughs> I think that would be so cool, and you could come back. I'll be the guest lecturer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's open it up to uh, questions. Uh, I, National Agenda is also a class that students participate in, and two of my students have been so kind to offer to be our mic marshals. So it looks like Parker has the catch box. So whoever raises their hand. Uh, yeah, let's start, let's start with a student. That sounds great. I fear a really technical question coming, uh-oh. <laughs> um, I, you know, today, uh, or in the last few days, President Trump at the United Nations uh, insinuated that he believes that China is likely hacking into uh, the 2018 elections, and whether that's true or not, doesn't, that's another thing. But um, you talked about Russia's influence campaign in 2016. Uh, so who do you think would be the, big, the biggest threat to election integrity in 2018? And going forward to 2020, would it be China, Russia, or some other threat other than the two of them? Hmm, that's a great question, thank you. Um, I haven't seen any evidence, again, of the integrity problem. I, I don't see China attacking our election servers or that part of it. I mean, that's just my visibility. I mean, it could be happening. I just don't see it from all the companies I'm involved with. I doubt that's occurring. That would be almost an act of war. So the influence is a little different issue, and I think there's a number of nations that have an agenda to influence America to its agenda, and I think we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, certainly Russia has been caught doing it, but I know that Iran has been pretty active in this area, China's been active in this area, other nations are active, because again, uh, the viral nature of the social platforms and the lack of law enforcement around this, or laws, doesn't say it's illegal necessarily to do. So a lot of governments are involved with that today. And it's just something we're gonna have to come to grips with is what is our laws about foreign countries influencing Americans in a particular direction culturally or politically? I mean, we've never really seen this before. So is it illegal? <laughs> do, we, do we declare that some you know, war kind of act? Is that you know, a slap on the wrist? Is that a tariff? Is that a what? But we're coming to grips with that challenge right now in terms of what we've done. But one thing I will tell you that I fear most is geopolitical tensions almost always manifest themselves in cyberspace quickly. So whenever we do see political tensions with another country, we oftentimes see that very quickly show up in cyberspace in American companies or countries and things. So that's what you worry about, particularly with the Iranian comments. Uh, we've seen more activity from that actor. Uh, we've seen other activities. We saw a lot from North Korea, what they call the Lazarus Group before. Now that abated a little bit more. They went after South America's markets now to kind of keep working on their skills. So, you know, it's a... It's an ever-changing political environment, but the tensions create a lot of cyberspace activity quickly. It reminds me of that game Risk. <laughs> like, the, yeah. you know, there's all these different powers that are, are kind of vying for. And a question came up earlier today that I thought was interesting, which was, should, would a potential cyber attack <coughs> have the same or additional impact as sort of what we know now as a, a potential 9-11 or something like that. Could, could a cyber attack against this country be as big as a 9-11? I believe so. I, I believe, and I, I talked about this with your class a little bit, but right now the capability, uh, we believe the number of countries with strong cyber weaponry now is about 30, 29 countries in the world have a, what we think of as a strong posture for cyber offense. 
And the capability is very high now, in my opinion, to perpetrate some sort of infrastructure attack. The question is, is motivation there? And is the ability to be motivated to do it with that capability? We watched that with North Korea with Sony. They got some capability. The interview movie created motivation, and they attacked Sony. We watched this with other types of attacks when we first were putting sanctions on Iran. We saw Iranian DDoS attacks on our financial infrastructure. Their capability was relatively low. Their motivation was high. They perpetrated those attacks. They brought down quite a bit of banking infrastructure, website infrastructure for periods of time. Now their capability is even higher. Their motivation is rising. And we see the opportunity for these things to occur. We knew Russia always had the capability through our sanctioning process and some of their motivations. They got high enough to do an attack. That's the balance we have to watch for. That's what worries me about some of the rhetoric that's being used today. You're putting more pressure geopolitically on an adversary to inflict something back that has capability. And in an asymmetric theater, as I mentioned, that worries me that we could be in harm's way. I just believe we need to calm down that rhetoric quite a bit and collaborate a lot more. It just has to happen. We need rules of conduct in cyberspace like we do in the kinetic physical world. We have to come together as nations to create a more safe environment with that. But it feels like we've gotten further away from that, not closer to that recently. So I don't know how many of you remember uh, President Obama put together a series of cyber peace treaties um, one of which was with China in 2015, the summer of 2015. And we literally saw a massive drop off of Chinese attacks post the peace treaty. That was a very positive uh, peace treaty. Uh, we also did some with other nations, uh, what we call our five eye counterparts. And we ultimately slowed the amount of cyber activity dramatically through diplomatic communications and negotiations. So, you know, one man's view, boy, we have to really work on that. That's critical. All right, let's take a question from a community member. I think Parker still has the queue or the catch box, but let's take a question from someone from the community that's not a student. There's one right back there, Parker. Thank you. We actually throw it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I caught it. Catch box. Um, in the state of Maryland, one of the subcontractors for our election machines is owned, the company is owned by a Russian. Senator Bill Nelson in Florida says that the Russians are in the counties, certain counties of Florida, in their election base. They have already infiltrated that. I believe it was Wisconsin that 500,000 individuals, their information was hacked, supposedly by Russians. What type of effort are we making to protect our election machinery? Maryland has a paper ballot, so there will always be a backup to what the computer is because it, he, I've read that a lot of the secretaries of states of states uh, are very confident in their all uh, computerized elections, yet their software is ancient and they don't have, it appears to be the same capabilities as new software. What are we doing to protect the actual machine, the thing that registers our vote, the thing that says that you are in the right place to vote, uh, what are we doing to protect that? Okay, to thank you. Great question. Election? Thank you. Great question, thank you. Again, I can talk about this as a, you know, an opinion, okay? Um, somewhat of an expert opinion, but an opinion. There's been a lot of study, a lot of work, pen testing and penetration testing this equipment, the software, the hardware. I feel really good for the most part that the integrity of that voting process will be in place. I really do. And I think we've done, you know, best efforts in this area to make sure that that has been done. Having said that, the first part of your question and comment is something that worries me. I kind of think one of our biggest risks in America right now is what I call the insider threat, which is essentially human infiltration to America's infrastructure such that they could act like Americans, but they're actually working on behalf of another country to perpetrate some sort of influence or some sort of crime. And this was true of the um, agency and entity that was setting up the election process for the Russians. And we just have such an open border, such a, 
uh, immigration policy that enabled that to occur, a lot of breaches that occurred over a number of years, was all about stealing credentials and personal information, healthcare records, even the OPM was breached with all our classified clearances, such that foreign nations could replicate and put in place personnel in America. So until we eradicate some of that insider threat, it's gonna be hard for us to see what's coming in terms of the problems that may end up resulting in this. But software, hardware, machinery, I feel good about. Who operates that machinery and the human behind that is what you probably worry about a little bit, at least from my perspective, watching that. Because in many cases for me, I've seen a lot of insider threat, what looks like an insider threat. This is an employee already hired by the firm that is actually perpetrating from within. It's not an outside-in hack, it's an inside-out hack. And I talk a lot about one of the education problems I see right now, I'm not as fearful of an outside-in hack as I am an inside-out, and occurring from the inside-out as a human inside this enterprise. And that keeps me up at night right now, how to solve that problem, because there's no amount of technology I can actually deploy to really understand that. I actually have to study human behavior more, and I gotta monitor the humans inside the company more in order to see what deviant behavior they might be doing. But we've always trusted those employees. We've always trusted that. And that's kind of what happened with the Snowden situation and other contractors, we trusted those employees who then kind of hurt that enterprise in some way, shape, or form. So, feel good about the machinery and the code, worry a little bit about you know, the human side of things right now, especially with radicalization and other influences we've seen too. Thank you. All right, Hannah's got the catch box. So is there a student that has a question? Is there a cheery, optimistic question? Yeah, cheery, optimistic question. <laughs> so earlier in class, you alluded to the fact that paper money might be obsolete within the next five years. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, one of, the, one of the comments I made was just watching the change in our commerce systems right before our eyes. It's just so fun to watch. Uh, the, uh, the, the speed of which our commerce is operating, the types of cryptocurrencies we're starting to see, the effects of them, and it, I mean, we're just in a race to a virtual currency model. It seems pretty obvious to me. The question is, what year is it gonna be? But you know, certainly a lot of, uh, a lot of adoption uh, is occurring quickly. The question will be is how how sustainable is blockchain technology under some of that to really make it more secure, a lot of debate. We could talk all night about blockchaining and some of the authentication encryption techniques that that can bring. But ultimately, it feels to me like commerce is gone. I asked some of the students, I said, how much cash are you guys all carry? And like, how much, like, well, we don't have any cash. So, you know, everything's pay by Apple Pay or something online already. I mean, you can just feel the movement in that direction. So I guess that's a fun thing. I have to carry cash around. I said, I like having some cash. Don't let your battery run out, but yeah, other than that. <laughs> All right, I think we had a community member with a question over here, Hannah. Thank you. There's a lot of talk about the dark web. And where does the dark web fit into all this thing in terms of cybersecurity as a threat or is it just activity? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Sometimes I, like, the question was asked to me earlier, it's like, what's the biggest misperception word or, you know, and I use dark web, dark net as one of them because there's like, ooh, this thing called the dark web that everybody goes to and it's not really the reality. I mean, the reality is there is some infrastructure under these tour routers that creates some obfuscation of who you are when you're in certain sections of the internet, but, you know, basically, you know, that's not a term, that's reality, is people really dealing on the dark net necessarily. But there's a lot of obfuscation that occurs for people's activities that kind of is perceived as the dark net or dark web. But what we probably have to worry most is, you know, I feel like that privacy thing is my biggest single concern for cyber. Privacy means I can't implement security in a way that I can see behavior that looks like it could be criminal, whatever internet infrastructure that's under. And I'm not saying the privacy is not good because we talked about this earlier with the, with the school as well, which is, 
in a lot of ways, I don't want advertisers tracking every cookie on every browser and every move I make. I want to be able to opt in on that, not necessarily you know, allow them to do that. So there's some really positives, but the more privacy control gets put in place, the less security we can create um, in, any, in any area. Good question. Thank you. Can you elaborate on that? Because I found that so interesting. I didn't th don't know if that ever occurred to me before, that more privacy means less security. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that idea? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of cases, uh, some of the behaviors that we'll see online as a result of the trail, the breadcrumb trail, helps us understand, was it really you sitting in this chair with your phone turned on, located in this hall, in this, yeah, exactly. That behavior, if I track it, I know it's Lindsay Hoffman sitting right here mm -hmm. and not an operator in Moscow acting as Lindsay Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And so the more that I can gain access to, the more I can validate that you're the real person and allow you to log into the, the network. But the more privacy I have that limits you from seeing right. where I am. Right, exactly. So one of them would be an IP address obfuscation, which you're not allowed to see what IP address I'm coming from or what internet protocol address I come from. If you block that, I can't tell what location you came in from. Now I don't know where country you came from. And suddenly, um, you know, there's issues that can, can occur from that. So the more I can gain access to, I can't let the privacy block us from all of that. So how do we create balance? That's the key. You know, we want enough privacy to have our freedom, but we enough security to feel protected. Wow, is that a fine line? That's super hard to do. Would you say we are on the far end on privacy, whereas China is on the far end for security? Right. Yeah. yeah, I talk a little bit about that. I mean, looking, what privacy rights do you really have in China with the way their architecture works? Not much. Here we have a tremendous amount of privacy uh, for the most part, and, um, you know, we're on two ends of that spectrum. So. All right. Sorry, I'm jumping in on the audience question time. This is just such an interesting topic to me. So Parker's got the catch box again. So anyone over on this side? You're right in the middle there. And... Amelia can go next. She's been waiting. Um, sorry, I'm, uh, I just want to make a comment on what you, something you said earlier. My name is Charlie Bonsled. I'm a professor here in electrical and computer engineering. We do offer a cybersecurity minor to undergraduates. They could go to the UD catalog and look up the department and find it there. They can always come to the department and ask questions too. We also offer a master's degree both online and on campus in cybersecurity. So I just wanted to... Thank you, Charlie. That. Awesome. Good. I'll make sure Sorry, post, I didn't know that. I'll make sure to post that with uh, the video that goes out tonight. Thank you so much. All the females in the room, sign up with Charlie right here. There you go. <laughs> All right. We have another student question right in the front row here, Parker. Sorry. Okay. Um, you were kind of just touching on this, but you were saying that as Americans, we prefer our privacy over security. And, but we've seen in the past couple of years that our privacy and social media has posed a threat and has actually produced physical violence. Like for example, the shooter um, at Parkland High School this past February posting his threats on Facebook. Um, so do you believe social media platforms have a responsibility to work with the government to censor and prevent things like this from happening? And what do you think that role should be? It's a hard question. Yeah, that's a hard <laughs> question. Um, a little of what I answered earlier was, um, you know, again, a lot of these social platforms aren't beholden to law or ideology for being forced to work with government on this. They can decide they want to or they don't want to. Apple made that clear. Um, I think others decide based case by case. So my personal opinion is they should. I mean, in these particular cases for the safety of our citizens and around the world, Every country that you do business in, you should have that same policy. If the government needs help because of a harmful situation, we should have that responsibility to help. That's my opinion. Um, but in many cases, a lot, of, a lot of belief is that that privacy is so important that they will protect it all the way down to not allowing access to a phone or to a social media account. So each corporation is a little different on the way they look at that. Um, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a good question. All right, it looks like we've got a question in the back. Yeah, uh, my name is Atol Kai, and I'm the interim director of the Cybersecurity Initiative. And glad that Charlie answered some of your issues you raised. But there are two things we are doing 
we are planning to do now first to introduce cybersecurity to non-STEM majors so that everybody on campus will have some background in the cybersecurity, not only for STEM. Mm -hmm. And another thing we are doing now is that we are trying to introduce the blockchain also as a class for everybody across campus. And like you are saying, the material science and physics, we are also working with them to introduce the quantum computing. Because you know the Russians have started working in the quantum computing, the blockchain, and the issues it will bring. So we at the university, we've already started talking. And then I think by next semester, we'll have a strong program, both in the blockchain and then the quantum computing aspect, so that we can fight against the future threat. Okay. Love it. Yeah. And I know we're also here at the university doing a whole series of data science projects cutting across the colleges as well and uniting that. That's a very encouraging development and I'm proud of the university for, for all that. So really. Yeah, we're, we're definitely on the cutting edge and I'm, I'm proud that the cybersecurity initiative is, is uh, co-sponsoring this event tonight and I'm hoping that as I talk with uh, uh, some engineering folks at dinner, that we can start introducing these ideas to the social sciences, to the humanities, and to other parts of the campus that might not even be aware of some of these issues. So yeah. let's make UD the next like cybersecurity aware campus. <laughs> All right. I'm going to add on one comment there if I can, just for a second, because it's really important to what you're saying. I mean, cybersecurity in general is like an education foundation, but I would really encourage the university from an education point of view to pay attention to where the biggest risks are at right now in the cyberspace and how do we get this youth movement to help us with this problem. We already talked about the social networks and issues there, but there are some other areas that it, it just hurts my head that we're not creating advancements in for the safety and security of our nation and our world. I'll give you two examples real quick that I've been very, um, you know, um, passionate about. One area is drones. So does anybody think drones are a problem right now? You should all raise your hand. Because last Christmas, 3.5 million drones uh, were sold. We're going to see exponential growth of drones. And what is monitoring behavior of drones right now? How much explosive device could be loaded on a drone? Why buy an assault rifle with a bump stock if I can go down to the local electronics store buy a drone and fly the drone into a stadium or an airport or a physical facility, right? So we have to move fast in this area. And some of you might have seen the Venezuelan president situation that you know, narrowly missed killing the president and a lot of the staff there uh, did kill people. But I mean, this is a real problem. And this isn't our cyber network. This is our cyberspace above our physical facility that needs to be protected. So how do we begin to solve that problem? I got involved with a couple companies, but there's like two or three companies in the world working on this, and they're all this big. And so we need inertia to solve that problem because the drones are creating a massive problem. On top of that, Amazon and Google and others are now going to be delivering, building beehives, what they call beehives. So a beehive is a ground station with up to 3,000 drones that can fly around that, delivering packages to your doorstep. So if we don't build security hardening into those systems and help in that way, we are going to miss another significant problem. And I've been talking about this, trying to get the FAA and others just from transportation industry to engage in this area. Another educational platform opportunity to do. The other one I talk quickly about is our satellite control systems. And one of my biggest fears is watching. Right now there's I think through 2017, coming this year, 1,572, I'm usually pretty good with numbers, uh, 1,572 orbiting, Earth orbiting satellites. We're gonna launch 3,000 more in the next 12 months. So in 25 years of satellite advancement, we're gonna double that number in one year because almost every industry is launching LEOs and NEOs now for whatever industry sector they're in. And what constellation was it launched into? What's the governance model? How much security is in it? And what critical infrastructure is talking to that satellite? And this is all using radio frequency wavelengths and other types of non-secure protocols that, again, education and what we have to do to solve that problem before it becomes a major problem is really up to us. I mean, I feel like there's enough awareness to it, but we've got to get inertia 
as a community to solve these problems. It was a lot like we saw, hey, here comes China, we already see it, or here comes Russia. Two years later, we've done nothing about it. And that's a shame because we can see the drone problem, the satellite problem coming, at least I can. And I've been trying to educate wherever I go to these types of issues that are happening, and we've got to go solve them. So anyway, long-winded way, maybe we can have a droning class too. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to talk about the drones. <laughs> Hearing about them earlier was frightening enough. Um, all right, I think we have uh, time for one more question. So Parker's got the catch box. Ooh, it's a far one. Can you throw it all the way to the woman uh -oh. in the center? Don't hurt anybody. Yay. Yeah. So you've been talking about um, nation states having the resources and capacity to, to launch these kinds of attacks. Are there non-state entities that also have this capacity or are developing this capacity? Just so none of us get any sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, there are. There's quite a few. In fact, one of the techniques a lot of the large countries have done was set up operations to look like it's a criminal group or some sort of activist group or a terrorist group as a pawn to the larger chess game that they're playing. So. It's another cyberspace problem is now we're setting up entities and agencies and operations that are really government backed, but they're now sitting in Northern Africa, not Russia, or they're sitting in another location. And so a little bit of the challenge we have is that kind of problem um, with smaller groups still motivated in a different way. Um, and now we're watching some of the ISIS kinds of environments starting to get cyber activities too. Should we end on a cheerier note? Like, wait, wait. All right, let's, what's one... I gotta come up with a better one. Let's, like, let's end with what's one really cool technology, really positive... I had a really impact. cool idea today for your athletic director, I'll tell you that. Okay. Yeah, so here was my idea. Maybe I'll scare you after this conversation, but I was like, all right, so... You know, we need, we need our mascot to be more present, right? The blue hen. So as I, I started, I'm like, okay, it's the fighting blue hen. We need like, you know, a lot of universities run the buffalo out on the football field or fly the falcon in to the land on the arm. It's something like, we need like a marketing present of our blue hen. But I learned today that the blue hen is kind of really like a fighting blue hen and it doesn't really cooperate well on a football field or a <laughs> basketball court, right? So I think we should get a custom blue hen drone. And that blue hen drone will be a beautiful drone that we can operate. You want a drone? No, we're going to get a simulated fighting blue hen drone. It flies in, does all kinds of music and colors at the stadium, and is going to be the first mascot drone in the United States. And it's going to show our technology savviness, painted exactly like a blue hen, and it's going to cooperate really well. <laughs> Come on, that's a good idea. Marketing. I'm not sure she liked it or not, but anyway. Well, now it's, now it's going to get out there. This is going to go viral. Go. We'll go viral. We'll see what happens. Well, before we uh, say thank you to uh, UD alum Dave DeWalt for being here, I wanted to make a few points just before we go. Um, I'm really excited. Yesterday we had, uh, it was National Voter Registration Day, and we had uh, over about 200 students, new students, register to vote in Trabant. And... Since September 1st, we've had almost 500 students, or actually almost 600 students registered to vote. And uh, it, having come to this campus in 2007, when we were rated one of the most politically apathetic campuses in the nation, it's really exciting to see students getting so involved. So thank you, students, for, for being here and for registering to vote. If you haven't registered or if you want to get updates about upcoming elections, you can go to uh, udel.turbovote.org. It takes only a few minutes to sign up. Tell your friends. Uh, I also want to make sure that you guys know about the Delaware debates, October 17th. It's a free event, but you do need tickets for it. So you need to get, uh, go to the box office at Trabant um, to get tickets for that. You can find out more information at delawaredebates.org. Uh, we have a living room conversation coming up on October 25th. This is where we'll have students from both the College Republicans and the College Democrats, as well as some other students engaged in uh, voter 
engagement efforts, talking about why it's important to vote. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that could be lively debate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it's to demonstrate how we can actually have civil dialogue, even if we might disagree with each other. It's possible. It truly is. I've, I had John Kasich and Joe Biden on this stage, and they got along very well. Um, so finally, the Voices uh, uh, contest. I've mentioned this a few times. We have an audio essay contest that students can enter to talk about why their voices matter and what matters to them, uh, particularly in this uh, election. And talking uh, the theme for this year is specifically about free speech, hate speech, things like that. So the last thing that I'll announce here is that we have our next speaker. I think I'm, I don't know if I told you this. Our next speaker is a 16-year-old oh, yeah, who is, uh, started his own uh, uh, email update about politics called Wake Up to Politics. I actually highly recommend it. It's a very nonpartisan update on what's happening every day on the Hill. Um, he did have to take a break over the summer when he went to summer camp. Um, so we, we had a month of no wake up to politics, but he has almost 60,000 subscribers, including you know, well-known journalists and politicians. So he'll be here October 10th. Uh, we should be a very interesting discussion. And uh, I finally, again, want to thank the Cybersecurity Initiative uh, for co-sponsoring the event, and I really hope that we can coordinate on some future efforts as well. So uh, please finally join me in saying thank you so much to Dave DeWall for being here. Thank you. By the way, real quickly, I just want to thank Dr. Hoffman here. She's doing an amazing job. Really appreciate everything you're doing. Great class, and thank you. Awesome to watch you. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good, Good night. night.